everybody. Welcome to Live from the Coop. I'm really excited to show you guys my chicken coop so you can see my birds, see how I raise my chickens and my ducks. We're going to start with a little introduction about how I decided to turn this into a chicken coop. Um, then we'll check it out, the inside and the outside, see the birds, and then we're going to sit down and answer some frequently asked questions. So the first thing I want to do is welcome you guys to the coop. Uh, my husband and I bought this farm about a year ago. It was August 2020, and um, I had a really nice, cute little chicken coop at my old house. It was a six by eight. Um, it was actually a chicken coop that was designed specifically for that. And I intended originally to bring that chicken coop here, but this farm used to be a dairy farm. And so they had this structure already available. Um, originally, it was a feed bunk and then the previous owners had turned it into a dog kennel. And since it had such great bones, as soon as we got here and as soon as I saw the building, I was like, that's gonna be my chicken coop. So we did spend a good bit of time converting this building into a chicken coop, and I'm really excited to show you guys about it. So first thing I wanna show you is the outside of the coop. Um, it is actually a split building, so I have identical coops on both sides. I actually have four different chicken coops here. So I can do four different things at the same time if I want to, that's really, really nice. Um, when we first designed the coop, we only had one section, this section over here that I intended to use, uh, but it became really quickly obvious to me that I wanted all of it <laughs> to be a chicken coop. And so we went from there kind of um, making our own design, splitting it up into four separate coops so I could do all kinds of different stuff. And we'll show that to you guys here when we go inside. Um, but the first thing I wanna point out with this particular coop is the ventilation. So if you guys have ever watched any of the seminars that we've done in the past, one of the things we usually always talk about is proper ventilation. So in this particular coop, we have ventilation on the top. So we have cutouts on the tops on both sides of the coop with um, hardware cloth to prevent predators. And then because this was originally a dog kennel, um, these cutouts were already here so the dogs could come outside. Um, and what we did was cover those with hardware cloth and then I can open the doors and we get really good ventilation in and out of the chicken coop in the summertime. And then in the wintertime, I can close these up so these doors are on hinges. I can close these up so that we can close everything up and keep it a little more warm inside the chicken coop. So just this, this building in general had really great bones. It was constructed really well. Um, all we really had to do was close in the top and then predator proof everything with the hardware cloth. And we were ready to go to make this a really great chicken coop. So come on inside and I'll show you how I have it set up. So the first thing I'll show you is um, my feed room. So I have this kind of set up as a feed room. It was just an open air space. Um, as you can see, if you saw in the beginning, there were some Dutch doors there that were open. So I knew I couldn't make this an actual coop. Plus I needed a good place where I could store my feed. So this is what we um, designed this to be. I keep all of my feed in barrels. Um, so my feed is inside of these barrels to keep mice out of the feed. Um, when I collect my eggs, I collect them, I set them here on the shelf. I do collect my eggs about twice a day, in the morning when I let the birds out and in the evening. So, But I will leave them out here for a couple of days before I carry them in the house to actually take care of them in there. Another thing we did, which was really great, is we built this hatch. And my brother was actually the one who came up with this idea. He's a really good carpenter. But we built this hatch so that we could collect the eggs easily. There are a couple girls in there right now. <laughs> <laughs> but that made it really easy for me to reach in there and collect the eggs. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this side was going to be the original chicken coop, and that was it. But when my chick plans changed and I wanted to keep expanding, um, this became kind of the, uh, the best uh, boxes, the best laying boxes for the birds, the nest boxes. The other ones have nesting boxes, but they're not quite as nice as this. So come on in, and we'll show you the inside of the coop. So, as I mentioned 
mentioned before, this farm was a dairy farm. And I'm sorry about the ducks. The ducks are going to be pretty loud the whole time. <laughs> so you'll hear them the whole time. But this farm was originally a dairy farm. And so this area was a feed bunk. Um, it has a concrete floor. So it does make it pretty nice um, as far as keeping odors down because I can just spray it off with a water hose if I need to. Um, the negative to that is that I actually like the look of grass or natural surface for the birds. We do have an area right outside of the chicken coop right out here. This is fenced in totally with field fence. Um, the birds cannot fit through the field fence. Um, but they can go out there's an opening so that they can go out and they have access to that entire area out there too so they go out there for most of the day and peck and scratch and um, they love it out there they come in to eat to drink and then they'll come in when it gets really hot for some of the shade but they do have access to the outdoors um, and then they have access to this run which is really safe and secure so works out really well um, We'll go inside some of the coops and I'll show you how I have everything set up. So, I have a group, I have a mixed flock. I have my chickens and I have my ducks. They are together, so they actually have been raised together. The ducks are about three months old now. The chickens range anywhere from seven years. And that's my seven-year-old hen, that's Mama. She's the oldest hen in the flock, that one right there. She kind of just hangs out most of the day. <laughs> She's the oldest one in the flock. So they range from about seven years old to the youngest are were hatched in April. So those are the youngest of the group. Um, they really go through the whole spectrum. So I have some that are really young that are two. I have some that are three, some that are four. So I do continually add to my group. So the first place I'll show you is my duck pen. So this is the duck pen. Um, originally, this was for laying hens, so I do have the roosts here. The ducks, of course, do not use the roosts. But they stay pretty much on the shavings all the time. They're out all day long. We have feeders and waterers in every single pen. So I have a feeder here with, this is our 18% um, duck and goose feed. The birds love this. They are doing great on this. They've never been fed anything else. So this is their number one go-to. Um, every pen has feeders that are hanging from chains and we have waters in every pen. Um, I keep my feed and my water inside at all times because um, I don't want to invite um, wild birds, mice, any types of rodents into my facility. So I try to keep all my feed and my water inside when at all possible. Um, these shavings are relatively new, but you'll probably be able to tell they're a little more wet than the shavings in the other pens. And that's because ducks make a mess. <laughs> so no matter what, you're going to have a little more mess if you have ducks. Um, that's one of the biggest differences between the ducks and the chickens is the amount of water that they spill. Um, but raising them is very similar, but they do make a much bigger mess. Just be prepared for that. <laughs> so this pen has laying hens in it. mentioned they um, range in age anywhere from seven years to just hatched. She's apparently very excited to be on video today. <laughs> These guys are using their nests and boxes and there are some eggs in there. I haven't collected them yet. But the birds do sit up on their roosts every night and once again I have feed and water. I keep what we call ad libitum feed. We'll walk out this way because she's a she might be drowning me out. <laughs> I keep what we call ad libitum feed. So I have feed available to them at all times, 24-7. I also do that with my water as well. They have feed and water all day. Um, I also have, a, this is hen house reserve. So I feed for my laying hens the 17% layer feed. Um, I prefer pellet. But I do feed Hen House Reserve as kind of a treat. Um, the birds love this feed. As soon as I fill this thing up, they flock to it. They love it. So I do feed this as a treat, um, but I feed the 17% pellet in the feeders for the laying hens at all times. 
So we'll move down to the other end and take a look. So one of the main reasons why I decided I wanted to keep dividing the chicken coop was that I had so many different goals. I wanted to raise the ducks. Um, I had a hen that was a strong broody hen, and it's a little bit stressful for those broody hens if they're in trying to brood eggs the same time as all the other hens are there. Because some, you know, the hens will get in the nesting boxes with them and all that kind of stuff. So when we divided the pens, um, I one of the things I did was set up what I call my nursery. So in this particular section of the coop, I have a broody hen, so come on in, we'll take a look. I know a, a number of you have asked questions about broody hens. We won't get too up close and personal with her, but there she is. So one of the main things that you'll notice about a broody hen is that they can, um, they will start sitting on their nests. They won't move, <laughs> they don't get down. They'll be there when you go out during the day, you'll see them out all the time. Um, they will get down on occasion, usually to eat and drink, maybe once a day. So if you do see them off of their nest, don't be alarmed. It's perfectly normal as long as later that day when you check, they're back on that nest. So when I noticed that this particular hen was going broody, I decided um, about a week before her um, eggs were going to hatch that I would kick everybody else out of here but her. I would make this her own special little room. So I did that. Um, she hatched a uh, flock of chicks earlier this this um, year, around April. Those guys are all doing great. They're out as part of the regular flock now. And then right now, she is actually in the process of hatching some chicks as we speak. So um, when I came in here this morning, this timing was absolutely perfect. When I came in here today, her first little chick was peeping out from underneath her feathers. So her first egg is hatched. Uh, but I'm not going to try to lift her up because if anybody's ever had broody hens before, those first couple days after their chicks hatch, they are very protective of them. So if it makes an appearance, we'll try to get it. But if not, we're going to leave her alone. Uh, but there are a couple more eggs under there I haven't checked yet, but a couple more that will hopefully hatch into little chicks soon. So um, since that happened today, what I'll do this evening is I'll come out and I will get everything ready for the baby chicks. So I'll put down feed pans with starter feed. I'll get my waters down on top of the shavings on just a piece of um, a piece of cart or not cardboard, but a piece of plywood so that it's easy for the chicks to find and then they can get started on their growing process. And I leave her here. I let her do all the work of um, teaching the chicks to eat. If you've ever watched a broody hen, it's really cool. They make this little sound when they're teaching their babies how to eat to like alert them that that's a food source. She'll keep them warm and I'll keep her in here by herself with her babies for um, a good week. And uh, I won't let anybody else in here with her so she feels nice and safe. Okay, and then we'll move to the last pin. So pin number four, same thing. Um, I have laying hens in here. Um, one thing that I think really helps, a few of you have asked questions about how you can introduce new birds to an existing flock. One of the things that I will do, so um, that mama bird, she'll have her babies over here. Um, there'll be an existing flock in here, so they're going to kind of know about each other, but not be able to get to each other. And that does help introduce new birds to a flock. Um, I'll give you some other tips and show you some other things that I think work, work really well. Uh, but I will have laying hens in here. They're, they're already in here. They'll come back in tonight. Um, we do have some of our makeshift next nesting boxes here. They've been laying in those. So basically same setup in here, nesting boxes, feed, and water. So just a few things to point out um, before we move on to our frequently asked questions. Um, my, pretty much my routine is in the morning, I come, I let the birds out, um, I open up the gate so they can go out into the pasture. The cows are out there too. <laughs> so they do share pasture with the cows. Um, they can go out there during the day. They're out there all day. Um, in the evening, right about dusk, I will come out. 
Um, most of the time the birds are already in. If they're not in, then I spend a few minutes watching them peck around for the last few minutes and then they'll make their way in here. Um, then at night, I make sure that I lock them inside their coop. Um, so every night I come in, I count them, I make sure everybody made it home and I close and lock these doors at night. So what that does is it prevents predators from being able to get into the chicken coop. Um, I do leave these open so we have good ventilation in the summertime. This is hardware cloth. It is um, screwed to the chicken coop so um, predators can't really break through it. So I do leave these open. In the winter time, I do close them at night because it's really cold. There's no heat in this chicken coop. So um, these birds acclimate from the, they spent their first winter here this year and they did great. So they acclimate with the, with the changes in temperature. I will close up the doors to prevent drafts in the winter time, but during the summer, I'll keep them open. So I count, I lock everybody up, and then that's it for the night. And the next morning, we start over again. <laughs> notice my pool you know we're fancy here we have a pool <laughs> you probably noticed my kitty pool at the end of the coop that um, the ducks love that pool um, as I mentioned ducks love water so they will make a big mess hopefully as we go along we're gonna answer some questions next but hopefully as we go along the ducks will get in the pool so you can see them because they are super cute when they get in there uh, but I do empty that every night. Um, I find the kiddie pool to be the best because I can actually pick it up and empty it. Uh, I filled it up right before we started filming. I'd already filled it up once this morning and it was already brown. Um, if you've had ducks before, you'll know they do make quite a mess in water sources. So it's best if you have something that either flows like a, a creek or a pond that's fairly big and can flow or something that has water that will continually flow through it. Um, or something that you can empty pretty easily. So the kiddie pool works really well for me because I can empty it really easily. I had a 100 gallon water trough there, um, but the, it was a little bit too big and it was impossible for me to empty it every day. So the kiddie pool was a way better, way cleaner solution for that. So I hope you guys really enjoyed the tour. Um, we're gonna go, I'm gonna grab some questions real quick. We're gonna answer those. I'm gonna point out a few things with my own birds that might help answer those questions. And then at the end, we'll take any new questions that you guys have. So give me one second, I'll grab my questions. <laughs> So I have a wonderful videographer today. Thank you, Kendall, very much for helping me. <laughs> so I'm gonna go through the questions. Kendall's gonna show you as much as she can of the um, birds when we see them. So I got excited all of a sudden. <laughs> and we can show you some of the things. You guys have asked questions that I deal with every day. So hopefully we can, we can help you out for sure. So the first question was about vent gleat. So vent gleat, if anybody doesn't know what a vent is, the vent is the area where everything happens. That's where everything goes on. That's where the manure comes out, that's where the egg comes out, and that's where the reproduction happens. So when the birds mate, that's the area where they, where they come together. So it's possible for a bird to get an infection in their vent. Um, that infection can be a number of different things. So if you have a vet, your best option is to talk to your vet, see if you can take the bird there, see if they can, they can diagnose what might be wrong with your bird. That's your first and your best option. If that's not gonna, <laughs> goodness gracious. If that's not an option, if you don't have a vet that will see chickens or it's just not something that, that you can do, the primary reason why most birds will get vent gleat is actually a yeast infection. It's very similar to the same kind of infection that a human can get. So one of the main things you can do if you, if you have a bird suffering from vent gleat is you can actually treat them very similar to how you would a yeast infection. Go to your drugstore, get a yeast infection medicine. You want a cream, you want the cream that you can put on there. Soak the bird in warm water so you can help clean off the feathers. One of the first signs of vent gleat you're gonna see is white pasty stuff coming out of their bottoms. 
Soak that so you can get everything nice and cleaned up. And then if you wanna go ahead and put um, that yeast infection medicine on there, that can actually help you treat vent bleach. So that's one of the main things you can try. Um, I think they're excited because we have a cow right behind us. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of the first things you want to try um, contact your vet that's your best option by far um, but if that's not an option try first to treat it like you would a yeast infection so second question um, I have a sapphire gym and she's making a gurgling sound she has for a while um, we sell the eggs what can I give her to not affect her eggs so that's a question that's really hard to answer if you don't know exactly. Let's go check out. Let's go see why they why they're carrying on. attention I guess so one of the things if you have a bird with a gurgling sound that's a really hard thing to diagnose it could be a number of issues it sounds respiratory and typically with respiratory problems you need to treat with antibiotics if you do treat with antibiotics then that will require an egg withdrawal so um, what you'll probably want to separate that bird from the rest of the flock treat her and then any eggs you get from her you'll need to discard um, but if you do have the option of taking that bird to the vet, that's what you should do first. Um, and then another thing you might want to make sure is that her crop is emptying properly. So the birds have a pouch right here inside their, um, right by their throat. That's called the crop. It fills up with feed when they eat. It's perfectly normal. You actually want that to happen. And then it decreases at night as they digest feed. If that feels watery or soft, um, you might want to consider that as maybe one of the issues that's causing her to have a gurgling sound. Um, one way you can check for that is when the birds jump on their roost at night, feel her crop. It should have feed in it. You should be able to feel, feel the hard knot there. In the morning, come back out early. If they're still on the roost, feel her, pull your feet out so they can't eat that morning. Find her in the morning, feel that crop make sure that there's nothing there if there's still something there that means she's got a slow moving crop and she might have a problem um, with her with her crop so you want nothing to be there in the morning because they should have digested all that feed overnight okay next question you bought a few pullets and they've been pecking and missing tail feathers tried several things nothing is working now what <laughs> okay so since these girls are pullets um, one of the things I'd make sure to do is give them plenty of space. One of the reasons why birds peck on each other, one of the main reasons why is actually boredom. So one of the things you can do, give them plenty of space, give them plenty of room to move around, get away from each other. And then another thing that helps a lot is to give them something else to peck on besides each other. So the poultry blocks are awesome for those. We call them boredom busters. Every time someone, um, reports a problem to me about feather pecking, one of the first things I do is recommend the poultry blocks. They work great, gives them something else to peck on, so give that a shot. Um, if that hasn't worked, then there are a couple other things you can look at. Make sure you don't have one hen that's doing the majority of the damage. That, can, that happens a, a good bit. If you find her, then you'll have to figure out some solution to keep her separate from everyone else. But try the poultry block first. Try as much space as you possibly can, and that should help. Um, some of my laying hens out here, let's see if I can, here's a good example. So some of my laying hens have poor feather structure. So this girl over here, see, she has where she's missing some of her feathers, that one back there. So when they're missing on the back like that, that's called the saddle. That's usually from the rooster. So that's from where the rooster jumps on the back of the hen and breeds the hens. That happens. Um, now this bird right here, who's got a lot of her feathers missing right around her tail. So you'll notice that happens a lot in our red layers, like our um, barn rocks, our isobrowns. Those birds I see personally have far more missing feathers. That's because those are great laying hens. Typically our birds with fewer feathers or missing feathers like that 
are actually your best layers because they're funneling their nutrients toward production. They're not putting so much of their energy into maintaining their, their body, so maintaining their great looks, you know. They're putting more energy into producing those eggs for you. So usually, when you have some of your birds with their missing feathers, those are actually your best layers. <laughs> okay, so next question. We have some girls in a 10 by 10 run with a box to jump in for eggs, a tarp on one side with a roost under it. Do we need to further enclose for the winter or will they be okay? Okay, so, um, and this, this particular viewer lives in North Carolina. So I'm not necessarily concerned about the winter per se, as I would be concerned about predators. When the weather starts to get cold and the food sources for the predators start to dry up, their natural food sources out in the woods, they're gonna to try to find an easy meal. And your birds are a really easy meal for your predators. So I would make sure to get a proper coop that you can actually close those birds in. First, it will help because you've got to keep drafts away from birds in the wintertime so they can keep warm. And second, and probably most importantly, you want to keep those predators away. So in order for a bird to keep warm, they actually fluff their feathers up and they trap air underneath those feathers. And a bird's body temperature is much warmer than a human's. It's about 105 degrees or so. And so when they fluff those feathers up, trap that air, and then they heat it up to about 105 degrees. It's similar to when you put a blanket on. You're trapping the air between you and the blanket. Same thing happens with the birds. If there's a draft, of course they can't trap air because it's blowing that air away from them. So you just wanna make sure they don't have any drafts in the wintertime. That's the best way for them to keep themselves warm. Okay, next question. I have two three-week-old chicks that were hatched by a three-year-old surrogate hen, also five 13-week-old Easter Eggers, and two other three-year-old three hens. Total of 10 chickens. Any advice on feed? Okay, so this is a tough one and a question we get all the time. You have various ages, you have different types of birds, some are laying, some are not. Maybe you have a group of roosters that you're really, really attached to, you know, they're your pets. And so people ask a lot, how do I feed these birds? So in this particular group, since you have more young birds than old birds, my suggestion would be a really good starter grower feed, like the 18% start right chick, or a really good mixed flock feed, like our 20% flock maker. Use that feed, feed that to everybody, that would be what's in your feeder, and then have a separate feeder, which has, cal has a calcium source in it. So limestone chips or oyster shell. Oyster shell is gonna be the most popular. Have a separate feeder with the oyster shell in it for your three laying hens and your three-year-old surrogate hen. And then the rest of your birds, since they're so young, those guys can still eat the starter grower. Once most of your birds are laying, then I would switch to a laying feed for everybody because it sounds like you have all hens once they get old enough. <laughs> Okay, so the next question actually pertains to that fairly well. It's how to care for an older chicken. Um, so older birds you can care for very similar to your younger birds. As I showed you before, I have um, one very old bird. She's been here for, she's been with me for a number of years. I keep her with the rest of my flock. Um, they do all eat laying feed, but they can free range so they can get out and eat the grass and she does go out a fair bit. Um, so she can do that. Um, if you have all birds, all of them are older and none of them are laying, then I would suggest going with a really good flock feed, like the 16% flock maintainer. That has all the nutrients they need, but it doesn't have too much of anything. It's a lower protein feed, it's a lower density feed, it's a lower calcium feed. So it's better for non-producing poultry. Okay. Any suggestions on a prefabricated chicken coop? I am in a wheelchair, what style would you suggest? So my chicken coop that I had before I moved here was an awesome option. You want something with a door, um, a low threshold so that you could actually even get into the chicken coop if you need to. Um, something where you can collect the eggs on the outside of the coop is definitely um, something that I would look for. If you buy a free a, a prefab chicken coop, most of them are going to have those access doors on the outside where you can really easily collect those eggs. 
Um, most of the companies that build like storage buildings or you know the small little outdoor barns that you can buy will also have chicken coop um, options. Um, I bought my original from a, from a just a young couple that was actually building chicken coops as, on the side to make extra money and it was an awesome coop really well made so if you just go online you google some of those you can find those really really easily but i would look for something where you can collect the eggs on the outside and one that has a very low threshold so so you can really easily get in there and look around inside the chicken coop count everybody at night and all that kind of stuff okay broody hens best to allow to hatch a clutch once or if you really don't want chicks what's the best way to discourage them so, um, broody hens are the hens, like I showed you before, that decide that they're done getting up and walking around all day and they're going to sit on a clutch of eggs. Um, most breeds are actually not going to be broody. Um, so, you, if you want broody hens, then you want to pick a breed that actually will go broody. Um, if you don't want broody hens, go for a breed that will not go broody. So, you can actually control that a little bit. Um, broody hens, if you want to discourage them from laying eggs, one of the things you can do is collect their eggs every day. So that can get, you know, where you reach in underneath them, you don't actually let them sit. Um, you can move them to a location where they're not quite so comfortable. So perhaps you move them to a wire cage or you put something that's not really comfortable if they're brooding like mine did in a nesting box. Um, they make some of that scratchy astroturf. You can put that down so it's not a really comfortable place for her to sit. Sometimes that will discourage them from going broody. So th those are a couple things you can do. Um, my hen that's broody in here, I actually did not intend to have a broody hen um, because when they hatch out their chicks, nature's gonna give you 50-50. So you end up with too many roosters, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so I actually try to discourage my hens from going broody or choose breeds that don't go broody. But this particular hen was insistent and a little bit mean. So she, whenever I would try to take her eggs away, she would peck me pretty hard. And so I was like, all right, you win, you get to go broody. So you can tell pretty much which ones really really are had the innate, you know, they, they really want to go broody and which ones don't. Can you give advice on treating bumblefoot? Okay. So bumblefoot is an infection that birds can get in their feet. Um, we'll walk in here real quick and I'll show you. So um, one of the things about bumblefoot, um, they usually get that infection because they get an injury. So a small nick or a small tear or a splinter in their foot. And then where they walk around on their shavings. Um, so of course this is where the manure is as well, right? So when they walk around, they'll pick up manure on their feet and then those bad bacteria get inside and they get an infection. That's usually how bumblefoot starts. So one of the things you wanna do to help prevent bumblefoot is to make sure when your roosts, whatever roosts you choose, have a smooth surface. So um, these, these roosts have been up here for a year, so they're getting a little bit older. But one of the things I like to do every once in a while is run my hand across them and make sure they're not starting to splinter. Because when the birds jump up here, I don't want them to get splinters in their feet, of course. So, and especially when I'm cleaning them, if I'm cleaning manure off of them with a scraper, I try to make sure that I don't scrape too hard where I'm causing nicks or I'm causing any of the wood to kind of splinter up. So that's one of the things that I that you want to make sure you look for is that you use a nice smooth surface. Wherever the birds are walking around, you want that to be a nice soft surface. So when they jump off of these roosts, of course, they're jumping pretty hard. So you want to put your bedding down at least two inches. I use shavings because I like it. It's my favorite thing to use. Um, composts really well, absorbs a lot of moisture. So you wanna make sure that bedding's pretty pretty thick so when they jump down, they have a soft surface to land on so they're not landing on something that could cause injury to their feet. Um, if you do get bumblefoot, one of the things you can do is soak the foot in Epsom salts. See if you can try to get some of that infection to draw out. Um, and then you will have to wrap that foot up and make sure you give it plenty of time to heal over before you put the bird back into general population. So it'll, it'll look like a big knot on their foot. You just soak that, get it nice and soft, see if you can draw out that infection, 
wrap it up until it heals completely. And then of course, any of the medical, any of the um, advice about injuries or um, you know problems with health and all of that kind of stuff, I'm always going to recommend talk to your vet, see what your vet recommends. They might have a really good solution, a much faster solution for you. Okay, so we'll go back out here for a second. All right, so the next question is the top tip of my chick's beak broke off. I isolated her until the bleeding stopped. Is there anything special that I should do? Um, so as long as that bird can eat, she should be okay. Keep an eye on her, make sure she can eat. Um, there is a um, cross beak is a something that happens quite a bit. If you raise show poultry, um, then a cross beak would be an automatic disqualification on show birds. So that would be a bird that you would not want to breed. Um, and people will talk, ask me all the time. They say, I have a cross beak. Is there anything I can do about it? As long as that bird is eating, then don't worry about it. They're probably doing just fine. As long as you don't see the infection from the broken tip, then it should be fine. Um, they can live really wonderful, nice lives with injuries as long as we just keep an eye on them, make sure they can eat and drink really well, and they're not getting picked on by the other birds in the flock. How do you keep your poultry busy and healthy in winter months when free roam is not available? Okay, so I actually let my birds free range all year long. <laughs> so I let them out in the winter. They do eat far more of the feed that I put in the coop for them during the winter, of course, because they're not getting as much nutrition from the grass and the bugs and all that stuff uh, but I still let them out so that they can actually walk around out there um, you know get some exercise keep themselves occupied here in this particular coop um, if it's really muddy then I'll keep them inside this area my old coop had a covered run um, it was on grass but of course there was no grass in the run because the birds pecked it completely dry uh, but I still let them out there all the time. Um, it will get muddy. Um, it will get a little dirty. So there's a little more cleaning you have to do. And of course, when their feet get muddy, their eggs get dirty in the nesting boxes. So it does result in a little more cleaning. But I do let them do that. If that's not an option for you, if you have to keep them cooped up in the winter, give them lots of other things to do. Poultry blocks are great. Give them as much space as you possibly can. Um, people, I've seen people with the chicken swings, those are great. The chicknick tables with treats and other things for them to do. So just give them a little bit of stimulation besides just hanging out in the coop all day long. And they should do really great until spring comes around. Okay, next question. What size chicken house and chicken yard for 30 chickens? So generally speaking, you need about one and a half square feet per bird. Um, that's indoor space. And I would do about 10 square feet per bird outdoor space. So if you're building a coop and you're building a run, those are the numbers I would use. Um, for 30 birds, I, I, I'm not real great at math in my head, but for 30 birds, I'd say a six by eight size coop, maybe probably even a little larger. My coop that I had before was six by eight. I had about 20 birds in there and it, I felt like it was a little bit tight. So I might go eight by eight or even eight by 10, um, just to make sure they get you give them plenty of space. And then outdoor, do about 10 square feet per bird. So about 300 square feet for 30 birds. Okay, ooh, this is a good one. I get this question a lot. What's the scoop on chicken feed that contains soy? Is this an issue we should be concerned about? Okay, <laughs> so most poultry feeds are gonna contain soybean meal. Um, soybean meal has an excellent amino acid profile when used with corn. They just line up so well. They fit together so well. When we use soybeans, when we formulate feed, we use soybean meal. It's a high protein feed ingredient, usually somewhere between 47 and 48% protein. It has really great levels of methionine and lysine, which are the first two limiting amino acids for poultry. So it's a really highly nutritious ingredient. Works really well with corn, which is a major um, energy source for poultry. There are a couple reasons why people want to avoid soy. One is that most soy is genetically modified. Um, so if that's your concern, then there are great non-GMO and organic options you can choose from. All those soybeans are grown with non-GMO stock, seed stock 
Organic is also non-GMO. So those are your options if you're concerned about that. Another reason why people are concerned about soy is because it has um, phytoestrogens, which are plant estrogens, because of course it's a plant. So it has little higher values of, of phytoestrogens compared to a lot of other types of plants. Um, the research on that's really conflicting. Some say it's bad, some say it's good. Um, I feed, all of the feed that I use contains soybean meal. Um, I just think from the nutrition standpoint, it's an excellent option. My birds do really great on it. Um, there are soy-free options. Kalmbach has a soy-free layer feed. So if you're interested in that, we can definitely, we have a product out there that you can use. Um, but don't be afraid of soy. I'm not afraid of it. I think the nutrient profile for it works really, really well. Um, so if you have any further questions about that, feel free to hit us up in the chat and we'll try to answer that a little bit more thorough if you need us to. Okay. The best way to keep your coop run from being stinky. <laughs> okay. That's a great question. Um, so of course in here, as I mentioned before, because this is a concrete pad, this, this structure was modified. So this concrete pad was already here. Um, I can spray it down. It works out really well. Um, at my previous coop, I did not have that. So the birds had access to the outdoors. It was grass. It was out in our backyard. Um, they pretty much had nothing back there but, but a dry lot um, after just a few weeks. So they ate all that grass, dug up all the seed and everything. It did get a little bit stinky in the winter time because of the manure and the mud and all that kind of stuff. Uh oh, I'm gonna learn about the birds and the bees out here. <laughs> because of the manure and all of that. But um, one of the things you wanna to try to do is keep it as dry as possible. So make sure you set it up in an area that has good drainage. So water, when it does rain, will run off of that area. Um, around your coop, if it's really bad, you can try putting up gutters. Um, that can definitely help. Um, one of the things that um, I did is I put small um, pea gravel um, actually, it was a little bit bigger than pea gravel. It was more like a smaller river rock. I put that down in the really wet places so the water didn't stand. Um, it kind of drained underneath the rock, and that did help a little bit. Um, but in the wintertime, that does, you definitely do get more of a smell. You can always put down a hydrated lime. Lime's a pretty safe thing to use. So you can put that down kind of over top of where the birds are. Give it a day or two for the lime to actually soak back in the soil before you let the birds out because lime can be really caustic on their feet. So you want to avoid any problems with that, but that can help definitely eliminate some of the odors too. So best thing you can do to eliminate odor is keep things as dry as possible. Okay. Let's see. This question is, winterizing my coop, how to keep it clean through winter and the birds healthy. Okay, so we covered that just a little bit. You wanna make sure you keep that coop free of drafts. Um, my birds do not have any supplemental heat. So these birds have to keep themselves warm in the winter time. I do that by locking them, them inside at night. They sit close together on their roosts and they actually do a really good job of, of staying nice and warm. The best thing you can do for winter time is to make sure you keep things very dry. So I've mentioned before in previous seminars that we've given, when I go in my coop every day, I take my little shovel, I'll show you. That's the advantage of live from the coop, right? <laughs> so I take my little shovel, I come into the coop, and I turn over the shavings. I pay particular attention to around the waters and under the roost because that's where the most of the manure is going to gather. Now, these are new shavings. If you if you had come a few days before, <laughs> I cleaned for you guys, but a few days before, it would have been a little bit, you, you would, they, they were well-used shavings. But I pay particular attention to around the waters and underneath the roosts. Turn the manure down into the shavings so it can start to compost. I make sure I get any wet spots around the waters that may be there. And that helps keep everything really dry because dry, cold and dry is always easier on a bird than cold and wet. Cold and wet is really hard on the birds. It, um, it can, it, it makes them actually most susceptible to frostbite. So if it gets really damp in there, 
um, then that's how birds tend to get more frostbite. If it's nice and dry, even if it's really cold and free of drafts, then that definitely protects them because cold and dry is always easier than cold and wet. And then once again, you want to be free of drafts. You don't want to have any drafts where the birds are. You want to um, make sure it's predator proof because birds have a tendency to, the predators have a tendency to come after the birds more in the winter time when their natural food sources are lower. <laughs> Uh-oh. Look away, children. <laughs> okay. What's the best way to trim or cut your rooster spurs? And how should we trim or cut them? Okay, so um, a rooster spur, I have two roosters in here. I have a black one and a red one. The red one has not made an appearance yet today. He is the less dominant, although the larger rooster, so it's surprising. When they're both out together, I usually don't have them both out together, but for you guys today, I let everybody out. When they're out together, the red one kind of makes himself scarce. He has huge spurs. And you can take a file, um, almost, you'll have to use something stronger than like an emery board, but you can take a file and you can actually file down the spur so it's not sharp. Um, it has more of a blunt end. Um, it's almost just like a fingernail. So you just keep filing and filing, although there is a point just like on a fingernail, like a quick where you wanna stop or it's gonna become painful. Some people will have removed spurs before. Um, you can actually pull off, it's almost like, a, like layered. You can actually pull off some of the layers. Um, that is difficult to do without hurting them. So I wouldn't recommend doing it unless you have someone who knows what they're doing to help you or show you. Your best option is just to file it down as much as you can, make it nice and blunt. So if they do use the spur, it's not damaging. So it's, it's more like a blunt end hitting you instead of a sharp end hitting you. Okay. My hen's feathers look like they're growing back, but they haven't. What's the best way? Oh, and then, okay. So that's probably because she is one of your best layers, as we covered a little earlier. Usually our hens with less um, feathers are the ones that are putting most of their energy toward producing eggs. So as long as the bird seems otherwise perfectly normal, I wouldn't worry about it at all. Um, now, if she's molting, going through the, the natural process of molting, then, then there are a couple things we can suggest. Can suggest and we'll go over that here in just a minute that was a couple questions here on the last page so we'll go more in depth on that in just a minute what's the best way to treat a respiratory infection in a flock crackly breathing runny nose swollen eyes and sneezing okay so that can be caused by a number of different things um, one of the things one of the I, I think I would be remiss to answer this question without talking about prevention so one of the big things you wanna do with your birds is prevent respiratory infections from happening. One of the main ways you can do that, don't introduce new birds without quarantine. And second, try not to set it up so that you're inviting wild birds, because wild birds can be vectors for a lot of those respiratory illnesses. So you don't wanna be feeding wild birds, like have bird feeders wherever your chickens can get to. Because, of course, you put your bird feeders out front, they spill the feed, and your chickens are eating underneath those bird feeders, what the birds, what the birds spill. I see that quite a bit. You want to avoid that because you don't want those wild birds to be a vector to introducing disease. Um, another thing you want to try to do is make sure you clean your boots if you go to any other farm or not wear those boots for a few days. Um, just to make sure that you're not passing any disease from one farm to the other. If you do have a respiratory infection and they happen, it's happened with me, with me before, um, talk to your vet, see if they can figure out exactly what it is, and then you can get the right treatment options for that. Um, if that's not an option, of course, most respiratory infections are going to be bacterial or viral. Um, if you treat with antibiotics, that's going to cure a bacterial infection. If you treat with antibiotics and it doesn't cure it, then it's a viral infection and you'll just have to wait it out, okay? Do you recommend different feeding for molting? Um, I've heard of holding feeds for off season to let the birds lose some weight and any accumulated excess fat while replenishing calcium. Okay, so holding feeds are really popular 
in um, breeding flocks, particularly in game bird flocks. Game bird producers use a lot of holding feeds um, because they have a limited time when they want their birds to be breeding and producing eggs. And that's in the spring when they can get their new babies and then they can sell those particular babies. So holding feeds are lower nutrient density. So they typically are somewhere in the 12 to 13% protein range. They have much higher fiber content, lower, much lower nutrient content. So they actually keep those birds. Was it sure? <laughs> I've been watching the weather. I've been watching it get darker. I hope it doesn't rain. They actually keep those birds in peak physical condition so that when spring rolls around, they can get some high density feed into them, get them breeding and reproducing really quick. Um, holding feeds are not quite as popular in the backyard poultry world. Um, there are people who use them when they're doing um, intensive breeding. Let's say they have really fancy show birds that they're breeding and things along those lines. But for the most part, you don't need to switch back and forth and back and forth and back and forth when you're raising backyard birds. Um, I keep all of these birds on a layer feed all year long. So in the winter, they're on layer feed. In the summer, they're on layer feed all year long. Um, if at any chance, and that's because they're all different ages, so my younger birds are still laying during the winter. Um, if I get to the point where I have all older ladies, I might switch to a good maintenance feed in the winter time when I'm not getting any eggs. But for right now, we're on layer feed all year long here. Okay, a few more questions, guys. Medicated chick feed versus non-medicated chick feed. Okay, so I use um, a non-medicated chick feed. Um, I use the 18% start right feed with LifeGuard. LifeGuard is a mix of ingredients that help um, promote a really healthy gut. So there are a way to feed without using medications. The most popular medication is Amprolium. Amprolium is a coccidiostat. You're gonna find that in Every, almost every poultry company, every poultry starter grower feed is going to have a medicated option. It's almost always going to be medicated with amprolium. If you've ever had a problem with coxie in the past, then you want to use a medicated feed. Um, coxie is really popular. Now, each species gets their own kind of coxie. Lambs get it, baby goats get it, calves get it. Chickens get it, dogs get it. When they take a fecal sample of your dog at the vet, one of the things they're looking for is coxie. Um, now each animal gets their own separate type. But the reason why coxie is so prevalent and hard to get rid of is it lives in the ground. It either lives in the bedding, it lives out in the grass, in the dirt, and it takes a lot. Really, really hard freezes for extended times to totally get rid of coxie. So if you've had a problem in the past, it's likely still lurking around and you probably wanna go ahead and feed a coccidia stat just to prevent any problems with your birds. Um, most layer feeds, you're not gonna find very many layer feeds that have a coccidia stat in them because at that point, the birds, their immune system has developed enough they can usually take care of any problems with coccidia um, with their own innate immune system. Whereas the babies, since they still haven't developed their immune system quite yet, it's a good idea to use those medicated feeds if you've had problems in the past. Okay. What is the best layering for a chicken run and what's the best thing to do to maintain cleanliness? Okay, so I've mentioned a couple times already, the very best thing you can do for cleanliness is to keep things nice and dry. Um, I did clean out these shavings for you guys. <laughs> so these are new shavings. Um, I will turn these over every day when I come in here. I will keep these shavings in this chicken coop for probably the entire winter. I'll probably won't clean out again until spring. Um, because if I can keep it dry, it doesn't matter. If there's uh, the manure I'll mix down in here, it'll start to kind of compost into the shavings. It'll just look like a, um, like a sandy mixture as the shavings start to break down. So if I can keep it dry, then I go ahead and keep the shavings in there the whole time. In fact, I'll be 100% honest, as I was cleaning out the houses, I was like, these shavings aren't even wet enough yet, <laughs> but I wanted it to look nice. So I went ahead and did it. Um, but they, um, I'll keep them in there for months, um, six months, eight months, as long as they're nice and dry. Now the winter time, of course, is when there's the most moisture. 
the birds are inside more. Um, you know, there's it's you don't get the warm breezes to dry everything out. So I'll usually get through the winter. I'll have to clean out in the spring. Um, and then I can sometimes get all the way from the spring through the summer before I clean out again. So just keep things as dry as you possibly can. Any wet spots, get them out of there. Um, and then as I mentioned before, in your outdoor runs, even in your indoor runs, but you have to keep your birds out of it. You can mix in some hydrated lime if you want to help dry things out. Um, but just keeping good drainage, keeping as much water off of it as you can will help a lot in keeping things nice and dry. Okay, I have a rooster with rye neck. Um, he's fending for himself and seems happy. What should I do? Okay, so rye neck is a crooked neck. They almost look like they're staring up at the sky. Um, as long as he is eating, then he's probably, I wouldn't put him, I wouldn't worry about calling him from the flock. Um, if he was eating, seemed like he was doing okay. You just want to make sure that the other birds are not picking on him. Make sure that he's getting really good nutrition. So he's getting a complete feed, good nutrition. Not even a bad idea for that particular bird to do some, um, some extra vitamins in the water. You can get water soluble vitamins. I don't do any extras in any of my water. Um, all these waters are just clean tap water. Even for my new little babies that just hatched, when I put their water out there, it's just gonna be clean tap water. Um, so I don't do anything you know, extra for, for the chicks. But if I were to have a problem, then I would probably consider a vitamin pack, especially if I was having a problem with something like rye neck. But if he's eating, if he's fending for himself, if he seems like he's doing okay, then I'd give him a shot, see if he can, see if he can get by. Okay. Is it okay to mix five grains with half crumbles or pellet food? So when someone says five grain, they're probably talking about five grain scratch. Um, and we do get people all the time who will mix scratch grains with their complete feed. Um, the problem with that is that you are diluting out your complete feed. So when we formulate that complete feed, we put everything that bird needs. If that's the only thing that bird eats every day for the rest of its life, it's getting all the nutrients that it needs. It is a balanced diet. Um, when you add scratch or any other kind of treat to that, you're diluting out that balanced diet. It's kind of like getting your, um, your menu from from Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig, and you can follow that menu and you know you stay at your peak performance, your peak weight, but if you start adding things in, then you're diluting that out. And what we're adding in, when we're adding in scratch, is high carbohydrate, high energy. So we're diluting out all of the really healthy stuff with the really yummy stuff for the birds, and that can lead to nutrient imbalances. Um, that's one of the main ways our birds get too fat is we overfeed our scratch or we overfeed our carbohydrates. Um, that's one of the reasons why in my chicknick table, I actually use Hen House Reserve because this is a complete feed. So um, this treat that they're getting is also a complete feed. So there's no dilution. They're actually getting balanced diet from their feed, balanced diet from here. And so um, we're minimizing that. Now scratch, all of my kitchen scraps come here. I feed, I feed my birds all my kitchen scraps. So don't shy away from that. Just make sure you limit it to no more than 10% of total feed intake for the birds. And just for reference, um, chickens, laying hens, should eat somewhere between a quarter of a pound to a half a pound per bird per day. So if you're, if you're not real sure if you're feeding the right amount, just use those measurements. You can figure out if you're feeding correctly. Okay. Dealing with hens that are bullying their flock mates. That's a hard one. So every once in a while we'll have a dominant hen who picks on all the other, all the other chickens. Um, I have had that in the past. One of the things you, you'll have to seriously consider when that happens is calling the dominant hen. So if, she, if, you, have, if you sit back, watch your flock for a good 30 minutes. Watch them, see who's, who's picking on the other ones. You'll often find the one that's doing the majority of the damage. When you find that one, you might have to call her from the flock or separate her so that she's not with the other birds. Um, I have found personally that a rooster goes a long way in preventing that from happening. People ask me all the time, do you need a rooster? So of course you don't need a rooster to get eggs. The hens will lay eggs whether you have a rooster or not. Uh, but 
The roosters are usually almost always the top of the pecking order. And when they're the top, they actually don't tolerate too much of those really dominant hens picking on their flock mates. Um, so the roosters help a lot in that aspect. That is one of the advantages of having a rooster. If your birds have to stay together, if you just can't bring yourself to call one of the birds, you wanna give the hens that are at the bottom of the pecking order plenty of opportunity to get away so they have places that they could hide under, let's say pallets that they could get under or cinder blocks that they can get behind, you know, some place where they can get away from that dominant hen. And then of course, give them as much space as you possibly can. So those birds have plenty of room to roam, plenty of ways to occupy their time without having to peck on each other. Should I be treating my free range birds for parasites? How to identify and control mites. If, okay, so I, I do get this question a lot. Um, I do not actually worm any of my birds. Um, I keep a pretty close eye on their manure. I keep a pretty close eye on them. If I were to see a parasitic infection, then of course I would treat them. Um, one of the things you wanna do is make sure you're treating for the right parasite. So get a fecal sample, take it to your vet. Even if they won't see the bird, they can at least look at the fecal sample and see if they can identify what kind of worm you might have. And then make sure you're treating for the correct worm. Um, birds have a tendency to just be really healthy in general, so you don't have to worry about that too much. But if you're worried or you see a parasite load, go ahead and treat for it. And of course, your vet can give you the correct recommendation for what to use. Um, identifying and controlling mites. So, let's see if we can get this girl. I don't want to get them all worked up here. Get anybody too excited. Come on, mama. <laughs> See, <laughs> he's not going to tolerate anybody being mean to his hands. <laughs> so one of the ways you can identify mites is to look at the base of their feathers. She's a nice, pretty fat bird. But if you turn the feathers up like this, you can see down there where the feather meets the skin. If you see some white, looks like Q-tip type stuff growing at the base of those feathers, which she doesn't have any, then that's a sign of mites. Um, you'll see it all around there. It'll look like a general infestation. Um, you might even see the mites. See, she has good healthy skin, but you might even see the mites crawling on the skin. They're going to be um, mostly around her vent. So down here's her vent, but you'll see them mostly down around her vent. Um, if you see that, then that's a good sign of mites. If you see them scratching a lot, that's going to be a good sign of mites. Um, sorry, Mama. I got your feathers all fluffed, didn't I? <laughs> that's going to be a good sign of mites. If you do have mites, you want to do treatments. There are some, uh, a lot of really good off-label products you can use um, to treat for mites. So now we got to watch our rooster, make sure he doesn't get mad. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll be fine. If you do that, you want to make sure you treat the birds and the coop. So you want to clean out the coop, make sure you get it treated too. There are sprays, powders, all kinds of different stuff you can use to treat for mites if you do see that you have them. Okay, and avoiding diseases carried by wild birds. So this is the last question I have on here. If you have any other questions, put them in the chat. We're happy to answer them. We're definitely going to help as much as we can. Um, avoiding diseases carried by wild birds. So a few years ago when avian influenza was really popping here, I'll move on this side of him so <laughs> I don't want him to make you nervous. <laughs> a few years ago when avian influenza was making all the headlines and in the news, one of the things that they can actually see when we have AI breaks in poultry houses is that it follows the path of migratory birds. So if you look at how the birds are migrating and you look at how the avian influenza is moving, they almost follow the exact same path. So we know wild birds are vectors for disease. So there are, you, one of the main things you wanna do is avoid inviting wild birds to your coop. So my chicknick table over here, I fill it up in the morning. In the evening, I will actually empty this thing out if the birds haven't already emptied it out, and they, they probably will. I'll empty it out and I'll make sure I don't leave any feed out here to attract the birds. 
if I'm using a poultry block, I bring it inside at night. I'll bring it outside during the day, but I'll bring it inside at night because if you leave them outside and you come out early in the morning before you let your birds out, you're gonna see um, wild birds pecking around on your poultry block. So you wanna make sure that you're not inviting birds into your coop. Keep your feed and your water inside so it's not an easy source for wild birds. And of course, don't feed, like put out bird feeders for wild birds in an area where your chickens can get to. Um, another thing you wanna do is make sure that you keep your boots nice and clean. So if you live in an area, let's say where you might be a grain farmer, you don't wanna walk out into your field where geese were, just were in the same boots where you come back into your chicken coop. So you wanna make sure you get everything nice and clean as far as that's concerned. So that's probably the best way is just to not invite those wild birds to your coop. Um, you can hear them actually, see there's a cardinal right back there. So <laughs> they're always here. <laughs> you just want to not invite as many as possible around. I don't have any um, feet, I don't have any bird feeders. I don't hang any of them up for that very reason. I would love to, but um, I don't hang them up just because I have so many chickens and they're so dear to me that I just try to avoid that. So that's it for the questions. That's it for the tour. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed giving it to you. And if you have any other questions, stick them in the chat. We're happy to answer. And I wanna give a huge shout out and thank you to Miss Kendall. <laughs> Let's see if I can get her in here just for a second. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi. hi. There's, <laughs> there's Miss Kendall. She has been my great videographer today. We'll give you just a couple minutes of shooting random stuff through the coop and um, give you time to put your questions in there. And thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. <laughs> you can just film various things you think are cool. <laughs> Maybe we should have shot back here so we could have encouraged the birds to go to up come. and get in the, the ducks to get in the to get in the coop. <laughs>